Well, welcome to Science on Tap. I'm Susan Knight. Just kidding. <laughs> Carol Warden. I also work at UW Trout Lake Station with Susan Knight, and we're live. All right. Uh, Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, an idea conceived in 1905 that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. Um, at Science on Tap, you won't get a lecture, but rather have an opportunity to learn and ask questions about different topics. And I'd like to remind you of our partners. We have the Monaco Public Library, Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, UW Trout Lake, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, and of course, Monaco Brewing Company. Uh, Science on Tap is supported through the grant of Brittingham Fund from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we have four ways to watch. You can watch right here, of course, at the brewery. You can live stream at the Monaco Library, or go to the Monaco Library where they are live streaming. Or you can live video stream from anywhere you have an internet connection. You just go to the Science on Tap website and click on Watch Science on Tap Live. Or you can wait till later and watch the whole thing um, in movie form afterwards. And we also make an eight to 10 minute short of every Science on Tap that we do that you can watch later as well. And our next Science on Tap is May 1st, and our speaker is John Lucy, and they'll be talking about how Wisconsin became the dairy state. So tonight we have Patrick Goggin. Patrick is a lake specialist and outreach extraordinaire with UW Extension Lakes, and his focus is on shoreline restoration projects, or as he likes to call them, Native plant gardens, yes. Yes. <laughs> Patrick grew up in Nina, Wisconsin, um, in the country amongst old farm fields full of ring-necked pheasants, clover and alfalfa field remnants about a quarter of a mile from Lake Winnebago. He became fascinated with lakes when he had a paper route that went along a typical Lake Winnebago shoreline road with a mix of three-season cabins and newer homes. He marveled at the mountains of ice that pushed ashore in the winds if the, blue, if the winds blew just right. Patrick came to his current position after a time working at the county level in lake-rich areas on conservation of land and water. He is proud to help serve the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership Network of lake communities, elected officials, tribal partners, businesses, camps and resorts, and all other lake lovers who come back uh, to give back to the lakes and rivers. Uh, the job brings together some of his favorite themes around ecological restoration, the human dimensions of natural resource use, and outreach to communities following the legacy of the Wisconsin idea. So, in keeping with our tradition, we have a trivia question about Patrick. Patrick is a plantsman who loves to grow plants, any plants, but mostly native plants. However, his addiction gets him into trouble sometimes. Amen. <laughs> Even as a former president of the Invasive Plants of Wisconsin group and a, t <laughs> and a teacher of native plants, last summer his enthusiasm led him to growing a naughty invasive plant that his wife Keita found planting in her horror. What was this forbidden plant? A, cannabis sativa. <laughs> B, opium poppy. Or C, an invasive teasel plant with an updated Latin name. <laughs> the answer is C, the teasel plant with an updated Latin name. Patrick Goggin. I did dig it up, by the way, and discard it. Thank you very much, Carol. And thank you, folks. Uh, what a good-looking group you are. Um, and thanks for this opportunity. I applaud the work of what Science on Tap has been up to this programming is the Wisconsin Idea in Action. And you know, a lot of what I do for the last 11 years working for the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership and UW Extension Lakes, I've literally taught one 50 minute course uh, on campus. What I do is outreach to communities across the state who love lakes and want to do good things for lakes. And so for me, the Wisconsin Idea is lived every day. And it is bringing the university system not only to the borders of the state, but now we like to say, to the far reaches of the country, and we've even gone international. I've been able to do work in Nicaragua, and our partnership's been in Russia and Canada as well. So it truly has become a world pursuit. So tonight, I'm going to review some attributes and characteristics of healthy lake shores, talk about them from a lake focus, but really the themes we'll talk about relate to rivers and streams as well. And then I want to talk about a little bit of the critters and plants that utilize these, these uh, shoreland areas. 
And then we'll move into some of the ecosystem services that come with the, um, the, those critters and plants getting serviced by these ecosystem services. Just what do these services give us back? And then we're going to get into some changes that have happened on our lake shores and what those changes have meant for bringing some challenges to lake country and how we're dealing with those challenges is how we'll end our little 15-minute primer here and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So I do indeed help uh, support the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership. The principals involved there are UW Extension Lakes, who I work for out of the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. Go Pointers. Go Pointers. <laughs> Wisconsin Lakes, that's the umbrella group for all the statewide lake organizations that come together to do good things for lakes. So whether you're an association or a district, lots of business folks are part of that group. And then Wisconsin DNR. Our Department of Natural Resources provides technical support, grant money, we like grant money, and other resources that help us be successful. But really the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership is people. It's statewide, all those folks that uh, Carol just rattled off. Everyone from elected officials to our 11 tribal nations to folks who just basically care about lakes and want to come together to do good things for lakes. And uh, if you really want to get in tune, check out our lakes convention next week and grab one of these cards. And we can talk about that more uh, as we get into the Q&A. But for now, come join me. Let's walk down to the water. And I thought we'd start with looking at an intact lakeshore shoreland system. What do we see there? What kind of attributes and characteristics will we see in, in a healthy, robust, intact lakeshore? So I want you to close your eyes. We've walked out onto the dock and over to the left here. We started looking out in the water. And what do we see? First thing I see out in that water is a tree stump, a little cluster of root wads that's been broken down over time. And the ecosystem services that come with that root wad, we get food and cover for critters, right? Erosion control. Believe it or not, as that ice push comes or that wave action hits that wood, it's going to dissipate that energy. And also the aquatic food chain. Think about all that life there in the near shore area supported by that woody habitat. We have that whole food chain using that wood at some point uh, perhaps during its life cycle. Next I want you to picture out into the water at the end of the dock. Ooh, we have some, uh, looks like submersed vegetation. Oh yes, there it is, some alodea, some coontail, maybe some water celery. Moving towards shore, we start to get Maybe some floating leaf, water lilies, or water shields going on. And then right near shore, maybe a foot of water, we see emergent plants. Maybe there's some pickerel weed or some uh, bulrush beds doing their thing. So aquatic plants are key to this intact lakeshore system. And the services they provide, food and cover for wildlife, right? Lots of little baby fish can be in there as well as zooplankton and phytoplankton doing their thing. These aquatic plants give us oxygen back to the system. They provide vertical structure for critters, critters to utilize and to crawl around on and to do their thing. The aquatic plants also help from a wave reduction point of view. Think about those floating plants when that wave comes. They're bobbing up and down, just like a, a little bobber in the water, helping dissipate some of that energy. Or that bulrush bed, again, is braiding the uh, strength of that wave and helping to dissipate that energy. Well, now we've crawled up near shore. We've looked at our aquatic plants, and what do I see right here next to shore? But some fallen logs, trees that just have fallen into the water over time. And those logs position themselves along the water. They might be 20, 40-foot sized trees. And they're providing the same kind of habitat, food and cover, erosion control from that wave action, and ice push aquatic food support for that near shore food web. They also help just quiet the water down a little bit to give those aquatic plants a chance to do their thing. And so when we have wood in the water, sometimes those aquatic plants can get reestablished. Vertical structure as well from that wood being in the water. Next I want to look down right at that lake bottom. What do I see? I see some rock on the bottom, maybe some sand, a little muck over in this zone. Again, that substrate is supporting wildlife as well. Whether it's spawning and nesting habitat for fish and birds, maybe some mussel and clams hanging out, aquatic insects, again, providing habitat. Next, I want us to literally look at that land-water interface where 
the land and water meet. And what do I see? Three layers of vegetation. This is probably where the change has been most on our shorelines. Starting down on the ground, I have wildflowers, sedges, rushes, even ferns growing. Then I have a mid-layer, right? Shrubs, small trees, bigger wildflowers growing. A another layer of vegetation in the mid-zone. And then let's go up to the canopy. Most of our lakes up here have a forested environment. And so I have that vertical structure in a canopy. Some parts of our lakes, we even are lucky to have a super canopy, right? That white pine popping up over the top of those deciduous trees. Who's using that super canopy? Maybe an eagle, maybe an osprey. So that layers of vegetation along the shore, the canopy, the mid layer, the ground layer doing their thing. That vegetative buffer. Food and cover, but probably most importantly, slowing water down from a rainfall or water coming over the land, spreading that flow out, allowing it to infiltrate back into the ground. Maybe we're even lucky at that land-water interface and we have a wetland there, a bog edge or an alder thicket or perhaps a sedge meadow that's so rare now in the Northwoods. And again, the, the benefits of these, this land-water interface also provides all that structure and niches for wildlife. And then looking up to the upland area, hopefully we see intact woods and places for water to gently infiltrate back into the ground. So that's what an intact, pretty healthy lakeshore edge or shoreland edge would be looking like. We have a diversity of life that's utilizing that shoreland area, right? Everything from the zooplankton and phytoplankton to bacteria and fungi to aquatic insects, snails, worms, frogs, toads, maybe some snakes. I'm a little creeped out by snakes, but they can be there. Turtles, all sorts of stuff. The good stuff, those fish we're hunting for, any fisher people out there? Yeah, you're out there. I just say the word musky and some of you get the fever, right? How many of us have come to the lake for water birds, that eagle, that osprey, or perhaps the loon called us and told us to come check us out? In fact, 80 to 90% of all life is born, raised, or fed in the area around land and water, this near shore shoreland zone. But there's one other critter we got to talk about here, folks. That critter is us. And so one of the things that's happened on our shorelines is a change. How many of you, when you first came to the Northwoods or to Lake Country, you remember those things called three-season cabins? Anybody? Yeah. And the kids slept outside. Mom and Dad and Grandpa and Grandma got the beds in the house. And that's just the way it was. You made, made life work, right? Well, let's talk about that change. So beginning in the 1940s and really continuing today, but a lot of this went on from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we changed those three-season cabins to four-season structures, right? That second home that all of us are working for. I look to retire tomorrow and buy my lake house, for God's sakes. Might not happen, though. But let's just back up and think about that three-season cabin. Probably it was an area roughly 65 feet by 65 feet, for that little home to be put in, that little three-season cabin. We cleared an area. Perhaps there was a two-track little forest access road getting to the cabin so we could be there. But that's about it. It's pretty much a gravel road and a little cabin, and that's how we enjoyed lake life. Well, the impact of the lake was pretty small when it came to those three-season cabins. It'd be one ton of sediment to the lake and two pounds of phosphorus coming off that three-season cabin lot. And phosphorus is important because that's the driver for these algal problems that we've been experiencing in parts of the state. Well, let's fast forward to that four-season house where we start to move from a maybe 800-square-foot three-season cabin to something like a 4,000, 5,000-square-foot second home with hard roofs and an outbuilding maybe of a drive and a driveway that's blacktop. And so all of a sudden, we've increased the hard surfaces around this lot. And what does that mean? Well... We've got some changes to the amount of dirt making it to the lake and big changes on that phosphorus count. In fact, if we develop that whole 200 foot by 100 foot lot, we can get as much as 18 tons of sediment coming to the lake from that one lot. So that's 18 times as much as the, the uh, three season cabin. 
and 36 pounds of phosphorus from that one lot if we clear the whole thing. Now, that might not seem like much if it's just one lot on the lake, but what's happened is now we allow 52 homes per linear mile along our, our lakes and rivers, right? And so 52 homes times those numbers, you can see why all of a sudden we have a jump in nutrients getting to the lake, a jump in the dirt that's getting to our lake. And we've been studying these cumulative changes uh, on our lakes and this sometimes unsound development pressure that has come along. In fact, the number one stressor in the recent EPA National Lake Assessments, both in 2007 and repeated again in 2012, is the loss of lakeshore habitat. That, those three layers of vegetation we talked about have been, have been impacted, literally taken off the landscape. And the impact is that nutrient and sediment getting to the lake. And so what we're trying to do is get folks to re take a new look at their lot. And maybe think about ways they can either restore some of that native vegetation back to their property and deal with that stormwater challenge. Instead of that water just cruising down the access uh, road that comes to the lake house, can we manage that water? Get it diverted into the woods so it safely infiltrates. If we don't have a safe place to put it in the woods, can we use a rock infiltration pit or other best practice to capture that water and infiltrate it? And so in practice, what does this look like, this stormwater control and this wildlife rehab and restoration? Well, really, we've gone through three approaches to doing lakeshore restoration. The first approach is, we call it protection. You have an intact lakeshore system, and basically your job is maintain it. Perhaps your biggest challenge will be watching out for invasive species, that reed canary grass creeping in or purple loosestrife trying to set up shop. So watch out for those is really your biggest job as a protection approach to lakeshore restoration. Another approach, no mow. Literally just put that lawnmower away and see what's in that native seed bank. Oftentimes there's enough native seeds still in that lakeshore area that the plants will return if we put the lawnmower away. Your job in that case is, again, still watch out for invasive species. Your no mow could become reed canary grass or, or a bad invasive if we're not careful and watching. But the no mow approach, if the seed bank is there, can be a good first step in starting to restore some of that natural habitat. But in a lot of cases, what we do is the third approach, accelerated recovery, where we're putting a jump start to the system by returning native plants to that, to that setting. And so we plant a suite of native plants, starting with the ground layer, those wildflowers, sedges, rushes, and ferns, that mid-story of small trees and shrubs, and even vines, and then that canopy layer, putting in some trees as well. And so we can define shoreland restoration in this accelerated recovery approach as the practice that uses native trees, shrubs, and ground cover, along with natural and biodegradable materials Things like you might have heard of bio logs or delta lock bags or sediment logs or soil lifts, other tools called bioengineering tools that utilize natural materials that biodegrade but help give short term erosion control support to your project and let those native plants get established. Those root structures get built into the ground and help protect the site. However, doing this for 20 years, calling it shoreland restoration hasn't always been working. In fact, how many, when I said shoreland restoration, maybe I lost it right off the bat. But if I use different words, the language of conservation can be very important. If I call it instead a native planting or a native plant garden, all of a sudden I have opened a door to have perhaps people who can get their head around the topic. And indeed, most of us, if we don't garden, we probably know a gardener. And so if we can use language like native plant gardens, we help to soften the approach and get people maybe uh, to jump in and join us. And so, conversely, shoreline restoration maybe is too much of a jargon type term and we don't get people to buy in and jump in and do this. So who's doing this work? Well, basically it's the folks you see in your lake community, okay? It's faith-based camps or scout camps, the boys and girl scouts of the world. It's waterfront property owners like some of the folks here in the room. We have a Healthy Lakes grant program. It's been around for four years now where we do five best practices. 
From 2015 to 18, we had 24 counties, 66 lakes, 353 properties, and 559 best practices being put in the ground through the Healthy Lakes uh, grant program. The five best practices are fish sticks in the water, getting some of that woody habitat back, a native planting on shore, a rain garden up upland somewhere to capture and create habitat, and then either a water bar to divert water uh, or the rock infiltration best practice where we send the water to this infiltration uh, pit and it allows that water to infiltrate. So literally 500 and some of these practices have been put in through Healthy Lakes. So we're getting there. And these folks partner with county land and water conservation departments, zoning departments, area landscapers and nurseries, landscape architects, and other planners involved with these conservation projects. And really a lot of times the most important person is either that waterfront property owner or that local lake champion who's helping coordinate things, helping you connect to the grant, helping you connect to the technical information you need to do a good job with your projects. So to wrap up, intact, healthy shoreland systems support clean water and wildlife. But they also support our local economies, our local tax bases in lake rich areas like here in Vilas and Oneida County where as much as 50 to 90% of uh, a local town's tax base is coming from waterfront properties. Pretty important to the fabric of life here in northern Wisconsin. In fact, I would argue that water is life here in northern Wisconsin. So maybe I can start our question and answer period with a couple questions for you. Can you get, uh, can you get by with a little less lawn on your property? Can you plant some native plants? to help support clean water and wildlife. Or if a tree falls along your shore, maybe you can just let it be. What about all the real irresponsible boating that goes on in this area, including cigarette boats on the Manaqua chain and um, PWCs? There's a lot of people that don't read the boating regulations. I'm not sure how many DNR wardens there are. And then we have also wake boats now. Yes. And <clears throat> all of the work that you're doing on your little shoreline right down at the water's edge is totally destroyed by wave action. Yes. Yeah, it's a real challenge. Uh, both, both people not respecting the 200 foot slow no wake zone as well as the challenge that's come with wake boats popularity. Both of those topics will be talked a little bit about at our convention coming up next week, especially wake boats. There's probably no topic that Mike Ingleson at Wisconsin Lakes has gotten more calls from than wake boats in the last year. And so really it's about communities coming together and, and, and sharing with folks to slow down in those areas. And I know those are hard conversations to try and flag someone down who's there to enjoy the lake and say, hey man, slow down. We got rules on this lake. We all are trying to live here in harmony. But really it starts with a courtesy code. We have a little courtesy code that a lot of lake groups give out in that kind of scenario. And basically it just has, basically, language is play nice with others and respect the lake that you're on, respect the slow no wake. And so uh, courtesy codes sometimes can be a way if we pass those out at resorts, if we have a sign at the boat landing that says, hey, pay attention to these courtesies while you're on the lake. Sometimes that coaching can help get people past doing the inappropriate things on the lake. So that might be one starting point. We also sell a book in our bookstore uh, on recreational use, and it has some tips in that book talking through how do we have that conversation with neighbors. That can be a very hard conversation to have uh, about what the rhythm of life is on the lake and why what they're up to can be detrimental to the health of the lake. And so I check out our bookstore and that book. I don't know the full title. I think it's How's the Water? recreational use on Wisconsin lakes. What do you think the chances are of the counties regaining control of their shoreline management? Yeah, so the gentleman's referring to a little change in our shoreland rules here in the last <laughs> five years. I'm being a little uh, facetious with the word little there. Um, you know, in some ways I feel like I've been a failure as an educator for 20 years doing this stuff when those rules got rolled back. Clearly what's going on is uh, the legislators are saying to us, we want people to make those choices without regulation telling us what to do. I guess I'm fine with that if we do it. 
It's all about that behavior change and getting people to understand that they are impacting the health of this water and making it unclean if we're not paying attention to that storm water and to that um, wildlife habitat. And so I, I don't know what the chances are of that, that policy being ch changed back and, and counties getting back to where they have local control of those rules. Um, I know that there's been work um, through some folks here in Violets County to uh, bring those rules back for consideration. I don't know where that currently stands. Wisconsin Lakes uh, on their website might be able to share with you an update of where that stands, the, that yeah, showing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish I had better news for you. Um, it really comes down to having those conversations with our elected officials in real ways. One thing that a lot of lake groups do to try to create a, a mechanism where they can even have that conversation is to invite those folks to come be on your water. So when you have your lake group and you're getting together, invite your local legislator uh, to come out and join you on a pontoon ride and talk through the issues in that kind of way. Some folks have gotten traction with their elected officials by putting that invitation out and having those heart-to-hearts out on the water. So that'd be another idea that perhaps you can consider. I'm just going to ask for a little shameless promotion, but could you talk about the Healthy Lakes program, how much money people can get, how do sure. they get the money? Yeah, and there's a standalone website. I forgot my handouts, but I'll get them when I, we break later. Um, but there's a standalone website called healthylakeswi.com with all the Healthy Lakes information. But again, it's five best practices. Fish sticks in the water, which are basically three to five mature 20 to 40 foot trees that are put into a three to five uh, pieces of wood complex and tethered to the shore with duck-billed anchors, and then they sink down in the water after they uh, put them in on the ice kind of thing. That shoreland native planting on shore, and then the, uh, the three techniques for water and stormwater control, the water bar or diversion, the rock infiltration, and the rain guard. For any one of those five best practices, a landowner can get $1,000 to implement it and do it on their own property. The other piece of the Healthy Lakes website is we get that not everybody wants to work with government to get a grant like that. Some folks just want the information and they want to go do it. And God bless you, go do it. And so on that website, you'll find technical information for each one of those five best practices that coaches you how to create a good fish sticks project. How do I work with my fish manager to cite it correctly and so on? What are the rules, the permitting, the jumps that I have to go through? So they can check out those technical documents, all the fact sheets and information for those best practices are located on the Healthy Lakes uh, WI. HealthyLakesWI.com. Sorry. Does that help? Yeah. Good. Yeah, and so the way the grant works, on the Healthy Lakes website, there's a how-to video of coaching you through how to go about the application process. But basically, there's a couple simple steps. One, identify your landowners who wants to participate in the program. The way you can do that is just share the Healthy Lakes best practices in your newsletter or on your website and get it out there in front of your people. Sometimes it can help to walk their shoreland properties and just talk about the five best practices and which ones might work for their properties. But basically what happens is the landowner chooses which best practice they want to do and they sign up right there on the application. John and Jill Smith want to do a native planting on Lake ABC and basically that's the information we need. They sign a one-page pledge that says they'll do that best practice. That's about as much, and a before picture is about all we need to get that grant through. So one of the things Healthy Lakes is trying to do is use a community-based marketing approach to uh, incentivizing and basically creating an initiative for behavior change on lakes. And when we're doing community-based social marketing approaches, we're trying to reduce barriers. So in the case of this grant, there used to be 19 steps to getting a, a grant to do this kind of work. Healthy Lakes, working with the lean government process and, and our team brought it down to si seven steps. So we didn't get rid of the whole thing, but we did reduce the amount of e effort that needs to go into it, for example. The other thing we pay attention to is what are those other barriers. So barriers like, I want to be able to see the kids swimming. I don't want to do a native planting if I can't see my kids swimming. Or some grant money that's out there ask you to put a deed restriction on your property if you're doing a shoreland project. That's too much for some people. So the Healthy Lakes doesn't have a deed restriction, for example. 
And so we can start to chip away at what are some of the barriers keeping people from doing these practices and create an initiative that reflects that and pays attention to that. Okay, a couple questions came in online uh, from YouTube. Uh, what is the source of phosphorus in developed lots if you don't have a lawn? Yeah, so it's being picked up, uh, it's that dirt being picked up and rolling downhill with that water during storm events, whether it's rain or right now we're getting our runoff of our snow. And so you heard the numbers. Uh, in the case of that three season cabin, we only had, what was it, uh, one pound of sediment uh, making it, or excuse me, one ton, sorry. And it was 18 times as much on the, uh, the uh, four season structure lot. So we really have a lot more dirt trying to make its way to the, uh, uh, to the lake. So one driver of nutrients getting to the lake are, is the way we're caretaking our shoreland property. Now there's other drivers to that too. It could be what's going up in, on in the watershed, whether it's the farming community or development in urban areas and uh, construction runoff from that. So there's other drivers that can be, come into play with nutrients, but uh, uh, from a shoreland perspective, this is the one we can affect. And another, oh, you got a question. Thank you. How does 75 feet make a difference um, and how much is that being abused? In yeah, your in terms of buffer width, right? The buffer, so the you're, 75 you're feet. talking width. about the back from the water's edge. We have a 75-foot setback. Supposed to be. Not okay. allowing buildings to be in that zone. Try to keep those hard surfaces from being in that zone and so on. And so the spirit of that is to try and maintain that vegetation I talked about. Those three tiers of vegetation are in that 75-foot setback and other vegetation. The other piece is just not letting those hard surfaces be there is we're not delivering that sediment. We're not delivering that nutrient to the water. Um, so that's the goal of, of the setback is to set the development away from the water such that we have a buffering capacity. Now if you look at different studies out there, different size buffers, the width, we can go up to 300 feet in some places with, with buffers. That's going to protect obviously land and water resources more than a 10 foot buffer. And wildlife is going to use a 300-foot strip of buffer a lot more than it's going to use a 35-foot strip, for example. So we get different benefits given the size of that buffer. We've landed on 75 here in Wisconsin. And the setback number, how much is that? Yeah, so the setback 75, your, her, her follow-up question was how much pushback do we get on it being 75 foot? Uh, I think people have settled into the notion of it being 75 feet. I especially say that with the rule changes that came to be a few years ago. I think they would have taken a crack at that had they thought they could change it. Um, so 75 seems to be where we're comfortable. You know, the other part of this, these aren't in a lot of ways new rules. We've been living here in northern Wisconsin with zoning rules like this since the 1990s in terms of setbacks and mitigating things that paying attention to as we build our lots. The idea isn't to, we're not being anti-development with what I'm trying to say here. What we're trying to do is develop that property in such a way that we're, we're dealing with that storm water and we're leaving enough habitat <coughs> for the wildlife that we came to enjoy on the lake in the first place. I have a question about uh, shoreline planting of wildflowers, shrubs, or anything. Yes. Uh, are you talking about you know, disturbing the soil to uh, uh, plant these flowers or just surface scattering of seeds? Yeah, so it kind of depends on your site, not kind of. It does depend on your site. I've got that teenage lingo creeping in <laughs> on me. Uh, however, here in the Northwoods, it's pretty tough to grow a nice lawn, right? Uh, anyone else experiencing that? <laughs> Last year with the rain was the first year I ever had, we had green lawn through the growing season, for example. Um, so I guess there's an upside to some, some of this rain. But the idea is, it's such a scraggly lawn often in the first place that uh, a lot of times you can just begin to plant right into that and, and have success. And maybe you spot treat or just put newspaper down, seven layers of newspaper or cardboard down on the areas where you have a good piece of lawn, let it sit there uh, for six uh, weeks or so and then plant right into that cardboard or newspaper. You could also use uh, a product like Roundup. The challenge with Roundup is folks like me who are oh, easy, easy, easy. <laughs> Wow, yes we did. Um, 
I love this kind of stuff because this is where <laughs> learning happens and this is where the rubber hits the road. But 20 years ago, anyone who was doing this, what did they tell us about Roundup? Oh, it's safe. It, it breaks down in the soil. I remember looking at, not to beat up on Penn State, but I believe it was some Penn State studies that had that echo to them. Well, it turns out this stuff is not as benign as we thought. It's building up in our water, and it has carcinogenic and other negativity uh, associated with it. And so I try to stay away from Roundup now and to use things like cardboard and newspaper can be the way to go or to be more selective when we try to use a herbicide like that. So using things like black plastic or an old carpet might be a strategy on your shoreline. So if I just have an area the size of this stage, maybe I see a piece of carpet at the dump, right, honey? And I grab it and I bring it home and I use that to kill off my grass. I'm, and then I just move that carpet around on my property and create new beds that way, uh, killing the soil. Just know that you might have to spot treatment. Uh, you know, at my house, things like brome grass and spotted knapweed, even after six weeks, you roll that black plastic or pull that rug back and you still have something, still, uh, a brome grass still doing its thing. So, uh, but that's the treatment I would be looking at is, uh, and if you're doing it, use a um, Roundup type product near water, it has to be the one that has the, uh, uh, is for use next to water. And we, I could share that with you uh, offline. Other questions? Okay, we had another question online. Uh, what's the impact of changing lake levels on shoreline plant survival? Yeah, that's probably one of the biggest challenges with doing these shoreline plantings is if we live on a flowage or just in here in northern Wisconsin in the early 2000s, in that part of the decade we had low water levels. And now we're back up to either regular or maybe getting on the high side. And so part, that's part of what we should be paying attention to in our plant selection and trying to use species that are tolerant of that fluctuating water level. So a species like fireweed that we see in our ditches around uh, northern Wisconsin. Any, a lot of those plants we see in wet ditches, our wet ditches have snowfall and snow melt in them right now and other water. And then at other times of the year, they're as dry as a bone. And so those are the kinds of species I would be aiming for, species that can deal with both the wet foot situation and a little drying out during the growing season of what I'd be looking at from a, a fluctuating water level point of view. And we could, we could, uh, I could show you some articles and, and connect you to some plant lists uh, if you shoot me an email. Pat, yeah, I'm, well. I'm kind of a newbie, and I'm just wondering, why in the world should I go to this thing called the, the Wisconsin Lakes Partners Convention? Oh, wow. What's going on? What there? a nice pitch that is. So, <laughs> thank you, Ralph. Yeah, every year the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership and of late, the last four or five years, we've teamed up with the Water Action Volunteers, the stream side of the street, our stream monitors across the state. And we come together for three days. This year it's April 10th through 12th in, uh, in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. And what we do is talk about all things lakes. There's six different concurrent sessions over the three days. We have two plenary speakers. One is going to be an economist talking about how Things like doing Healthy Lakes today pays it forward and makes investments into the future for future generations. Another speaker will be Doug Tellamy, who wrote the book uh, Bringing Nature Home, How to Sustain Wildlife, talking about how we work with our living landscape at our, our, on our parcel and so on. Everything from flooding to the current AIS rules, all sorts of information is going to be at this convention. You can go to wisconsinlakes.org to sign up. but. Uh, We'll still take you, uh, I think registration is open through Monday uh, on that website. Otherwise, you have to be a walk-in. But please join us. Lots going on at that convention. Basically, it's that Wisconsin idea in action. It's research. It's best practices. It's how do you do this in your lake community and comparing notes between communities and trying to get after doing good things for lakes. So, yeah, please join us. Thanks for the question. Question back here. Yes. Hi. Hello. Uh, Peter Blaskowski. I want to thank you very much for coming here. Thanks uh, for having me. all these people to make some tough decisions. I was born here. My wife was born basically in Boulder Junction. My mother was born here. My grandmother was born here. I've seen some changes that were just frightening me over the years. Mm -hmm. One of the worst things I saw was the proliferation of unwanted plants in our lake. And the fertilizers of my 
key thing that I thought was the biggest problem. Even after the development of the homes and the lots, all the lawn people put in and they started putting tons of phosphorus and other products designed to grow their lawns. Nitrogen, that all went basically into the lake with the first rainstorm. I've seen entire lawns are washed into the water. And I grew up on Arrowhead Lake where there was hardly any weeds at all. And now it's so choked with weeds, it's really a disaster, to say the least. You being here is hopefully going to start turning those things around for people to understand the problems that are caused by all the fertilizers on their lawns. So thank you very much. Yeah. To your, to your point, so I think it was 2010, someone correct me if you're a better historian than I, but that year um, was when we changed the, the uh, configuration of lawn fertilizers and took the phosphorus out. And so now it's literally illegal for you to put that fertilizer on your lawn unless you can show that you, you are phosphorus deficient. So that rule change happened in 2010 and basically Lawns next to lakes should not be applying fertilizer with that, that, that high P in them. Uh, unless it's a brand new lawn, that's an exception. So that was a good thing. That really uh, changed the driver that you're talking about there. The challenge, though, is I mentioned that sediment that comes with these four season structures. And that sediment is what's that dirt that gets picked up in the water as it rolls over the land is what's bringing a lot of other nutrients to the lake as well. Um, and so Getting after that through these best practices like we talked about is, is, is another approach to trying to lessen this problem with nutrients. We actually stopped growing the lawn. So you took the no mow approach it sounds like. Not because we wanted to, because I was too lazy to. <laughs> actually, actually that's true. And our lawn, I think, was about, we cleared about 75 feet of frontage on a 200-foot lot. And I would say after about seven years, all the natural plants started to come back. And now it looks just like it did back in the 50s. Beautiful. I'd like to get a picture of that because I explain the no-mow sometimes, and it would be great to see a long-term uh, site like yours. But really, the seed bank is often still in the ground, those native plants can hold up seed wise for decades and so part of it is just putting that lawn mower away and isn't that why we kind of came to the lake in the first place is just to chill and hang out you know I, and I get it um, I had a scary moment a few summers ago I do have a rotting lawn mower and I do cut grass and I, I was actually getting into it for like 30 seconds <laughs> yeah I know and so I freaked out a little on that but I get why some folks, that's their happy place, mowing lawn all day. But <laughs> lawns and lakes and water quality and clean water, they just don't go together. That's what we've learned. And so let's just think about this a little more deeply if we could. Um, I think about my dad's generations when it comes to lawns. How did you show, if you were a post-World War II um, um, young person or gr and your family's growing or you're leading a family, how did you show that you made it in the world? you had a piece of green lawn and you fertilized the heck out of that lawn and you showed everyone in the neighborhood, hey man, I made it, I got green lawn on my, and I just, I can throw water on there and, and throw money at it and I'm just rich as all can be. That's part, part of the culture that we're working against here. And that can work, you know, in upland areas where we're not touching water, but even in those scenarios, we're denuding of the, that native plants that are supporting beneficial insects and supporting clean water and, and wildlife. And so, you know, lawn's the fifth largest crop here in the, in the United States. That's what we're up against. Um, and so there's a lot of cultural baggage that comes with that green piece of green lawn being a goal. And I, I guess I see that's part of the education that we have to do is we can't bring that suburban ethic and that lawn mentality to the lake edge because it means dirty water. It means algal blooms. It means my kid can't swim in the lake. I can't boat in the lake. I can't enjoy the lake. And so it's a tough, it's a tough nut to crack, but that's what we're up against. I think she's going to go here, and then we'll come to you, sir. What's the recourse once the lake is getting weed choked? I mean, is it going to be like that forever? I mean, we, are, we have a small lake. 
and we used to have the water shield lily pads on the lake, and they used to be within, say, five yards of the shore. Now they're out 30, 40 yards from the shore, and they're growing in the very center of the lake where it is deep. What has caused that? Well, you might have lower water and more light penetrating to the, uh, the other parts of the lake. I'm not sure. Um, so that could be a driver. Others in the audience might have a more sense of that. But, uh, and it could be the nutrient thing. You just have more nutrients getting to the lake. It's helping feed those aquatic plants uh, and their growth. Some of these things are also cyclical. They go in cycles, and aquatic plants can boom and bust a little bit. I don't know if you've seen that on your lake. Maybe you're in the high part of that cycle as well. Um, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I guess I don't have a specific answer, but we could talk offline and I could learn more about your scenario and maybe help, but um, yeah. Uh, down here we had a question. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. We'll get to you next. <laughs> what do you think about, for people who want to have some uh, facsimile of lawn, of using um, clover fields next to lakes? I don't know much about it. I guess some of the, one of the uh, solutions I've heard is more of a, a little pollinator lawn. So you have, uh, what is it, clover kita, uh, no mow grasses, fescue. And so it's a mix of about three or four plants, a couple forbs, the self heal, and uh, the clover. And, and it, uh, you don't have to mow it, and it does provide a little pollinator support. There's some blooms to it. It also has some roots that are going to hold the soil um, and a little more root depth than grass on, on its own. Uh, so that's a choice that some folks have been utilizing um, to try and instead of having uh, just a fescue lawn, bolstering it with a few more species. I guess I would say I would challenge folks to take that walk around your property and to, and, and to really try to realize, do I even use this grass? Is this a part of my, you know, the edge over here on the lakeshore edge, sorry, camera guy, the edge over here on the lakeshore, um, maybe you don't use that piece of lawn, maybe that's where the native plants can go. In the center of the property, in that access area, in the stairwell, that's where we're going to have the human interaction, you know, we're going to keep plants or go with low-growing stuff, but we're going to, uh, but pay attention. I'm telling you, if we walk our properties, I think we can find where we don't need as much grass as we have on our land. Sir, questions? jump in. One quick comment. Uh, I got rid of about 90% of my grass, but part of it became blacktop. Is that a... <laughs> the reason why I, my the re jokes haven't been hitting yeah. very well, well either, so... But just that's one of these things that happens. Yeah. So uh, I would just to your blacktop, pay attention to how water's moving off that blacktop. And I'm trying to control how it runs yeah, off. Yeah, perfect. That's what we're asking. I have a 175-foot-long point. It's only 10 feet wide. Mm. Somebody, and I've lost at least 10 feet of that over the last 10 or 20 years. Okay. Somebody might ask, why do I care about it? Well, on the one side that faces southwest, it's all sand and very little vegetation. It's a beautiful sandy beach. The other side is wild and shallow, and that's where everybody fishes. Mm. Okay. Now, what can I do to protect that little point? I, I put some smaller rocks in there, mm -hmm. but you can send me pictures hit, to my email. on two sides. Yeah. So I'd want to see vegetation on those shores. And so whether it's grasses or sedges, grasses and sedges, particularly sedges, are going to save the world. I'm telling you. They can still so, take the beating from Yeah, the they could take, you know, Pennsylvania sedge, for example, could take a little foot traffic, and at the same time, it's got enough of a fibrous root that it's going to hold that soil in place a little bit and give you some of that kind of benefit. Uh, same with some of our native grasses. So depending on how dry a site it is, I would be taking a look at trying to bolster um, wherever it looks like you have uh, bare soil to try and get it revegetated with uh, uh, those, now, there's those a lot of bushes with the roots, and that works pretty well, okay. but there's too much hammering. Too much? Too, the hammering from the boats. Yeah, yeah. And they're going right a uh, block away is a, a major access to the next lake. The other piece <laughs> is I'd be paying attention to that land-water interface, and if I can put a short-growing shrub like a sweet gale or the spireas, mm. metal sweet, steeple bush, a row of those right at that land-water interface, and then behind them maybe some of those sedges and rushes with deep roots, again, 
the uh, two things about the woody plants. They're going to help with that, uh, that ice push and the uh, wave, but also keep you know, geese from walking up there and trashing it or that kind of thing. And then if you put sedges and grasses behind that row of shrubs, you're getting another whole armoring of deep-rooted root structures that are holding that and, soil. And those ideas are covered in the website you talked about before? Yeah, they'd be in the plant list for the native plant guide for that best practice of native planting, but uh, uh, we'll make sure my email gets listed as part of this talk and shoot me an email and uh, I'll, I'll work with you, send me a picture and uh, let's coach you through what we need to. We had a question online that pertains just to that. Uh, what favorite native plants do you recommend for that first layer of shoreline plantings? Yeah, so it really depends on your soil. Uh, we talked about fluctuating water levels before. And one of the biggest challenges in th this part of the world is we can move from the wet-footed situation right at that water's edge to dry sugar sand scenario within a few feet. And so right where that transition zone is, that's where I recommend those plants that can take that wet foot and that dry foot situation some of our sedges, that fireweed I mentioned, and so on. Uh, and then, but you can look at those plant lists on, on the Healthy Lakes website. There's 150 plants listed in those six plans that can get you through. You can send me an email. One of the papers out there I have, we call them workhorse species. These are the species that have these root structures. They also have growth forms that, that support wildlife and so on. I could send you the uh, list of, of an article showcasing these workhorse species that lists these plants by zones uh, of water depth. Um, I was always under the assumption that if you had grass, that it would hold the water, you know, the, from going, all the stuff from going down into the lake. Is it the grass or is it the stuff that people put on the grass? Uh, so if, if they're putting nutrients on the grass, like the gentleman's previous comment, uh, that could be an issue. It could just be washing off to the lake. We don't see as much of that anymore. The problem with grass is that root structure. If it gets four, six inches down into the soil, that's about as, that's a healthy turf grass. And so you don't have those deep penetrating plants. These native plants can get two, three, sometimes 10 feet into the ground with these root structures. And about, oh, a third of those root structures are gonna die back every year, creating these little channels for that water to infiltrate back into the ground. Where a sod sometimes can become so hard and compacted from foot traffic, it actually acts like concrete. There's not much uh, absorption quality to that grass. And so if we walk on it a lot, like we do with our shoreland areas, it can become so, um, so like concrete such that it can't absorb water in an effective kind of way. And as we talked about, we just don't grow very lush lawns up here in northern Wisconsin, right? It's scraggly. It doesn't really have much to it. And so it's not even getting the function that a, a healthy grass could for absorbing a little water and, and even absorbing some of that nutrient runoff. So that's the challenge with grass. Whereas these native plants, they have deep root structures and other benefits to wildlife. Yes? Um, I was just wondering about my lake doesn't have a whole lot of grass anywhere, but some of the neighbors hire people to rake their entire yard, even though oh, it's a woods. Yeah. Does that just create more runoff? Yeah, great point. <laughs> Uh, and we did it with the wood. You know, that's why there isn't the wood in the water that used to be. We used to have 500 pieces of wood per linear mile on lakes where wood naturally falls into lakes. How's your lake doing? Do you have that much wood along a mile of lakefront? Probably not. So literally we pulled it out. So same thing in this case. That sponge layer, the duff, us ecologists call it, it can be this deep. There's a whole suite of plants that just grow in that duff layer. And that duff layer is like a sponge. It literally is like if you pour a jug of water into that a, a leaf layer of a healthy forest, it's just going to go away like that. And you can imagine that rainstorm when it hits that forested area, coming down the trees and hitting that forest floor and that duff layer, it just gets soaked up. Well, let's think about the lawn. What's slowing that rainwater down? What's allowing that rainwater to infiltrate? There's not much there. There's the blades of grass that pretty much flop over and the water just flows over the top. A little gets absorbed, but not much. And so that's the difference, that duff layer. And so the, the answer is, yep, don't rank it. That health, that's healthy soil building absorption material. In fact, with the Healthy Lakes projects, if there's any problem we have sometime is people want to go out and cut or rake that native planting. No, 
that duff layer needs to build back up. That's part of what we're trying to restore on these lakeshore properties is to reestablish that layer of breaking down wood and leaves and, and so on that becomes this great absorption uh, tool in our woods. Okay, Pat, I got a lakeshore lot. <laughs> you know, I want to restore some stuff there. It's heavier soil. I want to plant some cedar, some hemlock, some yellow birch in this canopy, shrub layer of Canada U, get some native zuli species in there, all stuff the deer just love. Yeah, I knew that's what was right? coming. Right? Yeah. And half, the, half my neighbors on the lake feed deer. Yeah. Aggressively, all year round. Okay? And plus, they were baiting too for hunting. My county deer advisory committee, which controls the deer herd, they want to increase the deer herd. They don't want to maintain or lower it. They want more deer, 20, 30 deer per square mile. All those species need more like 10 to 15 deer per square mile to survive. Right. Natural Resources Board, our DNR, they're not going to do anything to change anything. I mean, you just, an uphill battle. It is. It's, you know, talk about deer. So for me, and my wife will tell you this, she's in the audience, you can ask her, I put up fences, I really do. Every tree I put in the ground or shrub has a, has a tomato cage with a, uh, a little fencing around it. And I've learned to not use more wildlife friendly fencing that snakes and things like that can't. Don't go with the webbing kind of stuff, go with a stiff, rigid, small hold type netting around that cage. And then I graduate to galvanized four foot or five foot uh, wired mesh around my mature trees to keep critters from hitting them. I came home uh, on um, St. Patty's Day weekend. There were 21 deer in our driveway. Yeah, yeah, and I know there's the folks with, that's that deer density that you're talking about. So for me, uh, a couple things. I use fencing. If you, if you can't use fencing, I would go with some of the tools that are out there from a smell point of view, and I would vary those. So one for three weeks, I'd use liquid fence, and then I would use plant skid for three weeks, you know, the three weeks, do a spraying of that. Maybe throw, malar how do you say it, malargonite? I can never say that. But I have really good luck with that around my 21 deer kind of situation. I spread that once a year around our meadow and our plantings, and that smell of that seems to keep the deer away too. And then the other thing is, when you do your plantings themselves, some of the meadow restorationists I've read up on, they talk about if every, say the size of this table, if I have at least one mint or one stinky kind of plant that deer don't like in this size of my planting, when that deer goes down to take a bite, it's smelling that mint or it's smelling that odiferous plant and it might be less likely to browse. And if we're scattering those stinky plants as part of our planting, it can help sometimes deter. That said, if we have deer densities of 25, 30 deer per square mile in a tough winter like we just had, those deer are hammering right now our, our area. So I don't have a complete answer other than trying to use fencing um, and uh, some of these deterrents to keep them away. Big dog might help. Um, um, but it's a real problem. Vilas County here has done some restorations as part of a long-term 10-year study with Mike Meyer. And we had temporary fencing as part of those projects for three to five years. Some of the landowners, as I understand it, at the end of that five years went to take their fences down. One landowner, literally in one weekend, the deer came in and literally ate every single plant in that plant. That's what we're up against. And so I don't have the answer. If Leopold can't get deer right in Wisconsin, Goggin isn't going to get it right. But that's the culture that we're up against here in the state. Deer are a very important species. And so uh, we got to work with uh, what we got. And, you know, for me, fencing and deterrence are, are part of it. Um, <laughs> it's really true. If you go to, if I visit our tribal partners quite a bit, and it's true. You can just drive the roads and you see less deer kills on the road as well as you just know the deer densities are different. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a long history in Wisconsin, but uh, it's a challenge to get some of the plants you talked about. Um, you know, you used to be in all the ravines and all over our lake shores. Good luck finding a you in Vilas County. Um, I was in Forest County on a, a lake, and there was you all over. I just couldn't believe seeing you like that. It was, uh, it was something to behold. It, and uh, as I understand it, talking to folks who've been around, it used to be everywhere on our, our lake shores. Yes, sir. 
Sorry. Yep. I have a back I'm here. okay. I, you need the microphone. We'll come back to you, sir. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of comments and then a question. Sure. A couple of. Can you hear me now? A couple. <laughs> a couple of comments and then a question. Um, people talk about weeds a lot with regard to the water, and I'm not sure I know what weeds are. What a lot of times people call weeds, I call macrophytes, and I think that um, I've always been under the assumption that macrophytes can be can be indicative of a healthy lake and they're good to have. Second comment is that we are putting a chunk of change now for us into um, erosion mitigating. Um, techniques along our, our bit of lake shore and um, we're putting in riprap and considering putting in fish sticks at some point in time. So back to weeds and macrophytes. Are there water plants then that hopefully, say, let's say it's a success and we actually do get some erosion mitigating going on. Mm -hmm. um, can, are there water plants we can actually plant in the water that will mitigate erosion also and what are they? Yeah, so some of those plants we talked about depends on your water depth and, and, and how deep, deep a water. But starting with the emergent plants, the bulrush, either saw stem or hard stem, uh, the pickerel weed, for example, moving out to um, the other plants we talked about, either emergent or floating leaf. There are some aquatic plot, plant vendors in the state of Wisconsin. They don't sell a ton of diversity, but some of those uh, water plants are available, uh, and I could turn you on to those websites. If you look at the uh, Native Plant Nurseries of Wisconsin PDF, they're listed and just look for the aquatic plants piece of it, but email me and I'll happily connect you to those nurseries. And uh, one thing about fish sticks, just to share with you, I talked quickly about this, but we found when we put those, those complexes of three to five pieces of wood back in that near shore area, it sometimes does quiet the water down just enough where the aquatic plants return on their own. You don't even have to plant them. It just quiets the water down enough, and uh, they pop up. Okay, I'm going to take another question online. Uh, Vilas County says no grandfathering for viewing corridors, but Act 55 says counties cannot require vegetative buffers on previously developed land. Which do you think is correct? Do you need that again? Uh, I, I won't know either way if you read it again. I'm not a, I, I don't, I don't unfortunately know the exact rules as they stand now. I always defer people to Lynn Markham, our shoreline zoning specialist with the Center for Land Use and Stevens Point. And you can find her contact information on the Center for Land Use Stevens Point website or shoot me an email and I'll connect that person to them. Um, I'm afraid I just haven't stayed attuned to what's going on statewide. I can't keep up. Um, I'm more concerned with staying up with the research of shoreline plant work. but. Uh, so I defer to my colleague. Well, I have a question about Eurasian milfoil. Okay. Um, last year in our lake, probably June, a boat, big boat came and they were going to suck up all the Eurasian milfoil on this little section of the bay. Well, it turned out their suction piece was broken and so we ended up with all these little pieces mm. all over the place. So it was, uh, sorry, this happened. And so they said throughout, you know, when you're out kayaking or whatever, start picking it up. Well. Through the entire summer, I mean, I, they gave me bags. I just picked up a lot of it and then used it in my garden, which turned out to be pretty nice. But how damaging was this to our lake? Well, that plant even does that on its own. It's called auto-fragmentation. And in fall, it, it literally explodes in these fragments and starts new populations that way. So this plant is so nasty, it does that already on its own. But unfortunately, your your harvesters jump-started that. Uh, and, um, you know, the truth is you probably are going to have some new populations spring up on the lake because of those fragments floating around freely and they're going to set up shop. And so uh, I hope that you're under a pretty vigorous um, looking at those plant communities over time because you're probably going to see some change there. Now, if you did get out and di had divers or people picking those fragments up, hopefully you've abated some of it. But that actually is one of the strategies of that invasive plant, believe it or not. Sir, did you... No, nope, got to use the mic. I just I want to just, give you a turn. I was just going to back up a little bit on uh, regarding the deer d deterrence. Yeah. Uh, I did find years ago that by hanging some pieces of ir uh, iris spring you got it. soap in the trees and your bushes, and it really did work. Yep. 
I've Down, also human hair. If you can go to your the, barber and get the, some hair clippings. The downside is that, of that is that the bear really love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, just well, a, just know, a word of caution. Us bears have to smell good too, right? <laughs> no, I've heard that the soap trick does work. Um, you know, deer are smart. What I, uh, my biggest suggestion is switch it up. They get used to one scent or one de uh, deterrent, they're probably going to show up. So if you can keep them moving, keep that little brain thinking by switching up your deterrent, I think you'll have more success. No, I, I was going to say the same thing. And the same thing you said, switching things up is a deterrent. But iris spring really works well. And wire around your trees is an absolute must. We plant all kinds of apple trees and fruit trees in our property, and we've had nothing but trouble. And we've had as many as 50 deer on our property. Destroy everything. So try Irish Spring. Works good. Sounds good. He's endorsing Irish Spring. We should get some money, Procter and Gamble. Pat, I have another question. Sure. Um, I don't recall my phosphorus cycle, but once phosphorus gets into the lake, is there a sink, or is it uh, going to be there uh, to per, you know to perpetuate plant growth? Yeah, it, it, it depends on the situation. Sometimes it can get locked up and. This is not my expertise, so there's others in the room who can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Some of it can get locked up in the sediments. Even the plant life can, it can absorb some of it in, a, in some shape, way, or form. But really, that's part of what some lakes are having as a challenge is they've had a pulse of nutrients come in when that development might have happened in the 60s. And those lots moved from three season to four season. They might have had 20 years where they had a pulse of nutrients come into the lake. And now it's maybe equalized or an equilibrium, but you still have that nutrient in the lake, and the legacy of that nutrient may take uh, years for it to work its way through the system, so to speak. Depends on the type of lake, too. A drainage lake, you know, phosphorus can move in and out pretty and, and move right through the system. Just ask Pete and Well Castle Rock. They'll tell you all about how that works. Uh, conversely, a seepage lake, it might be locked more into that lake for, for a longer period of time. So landscape position matters. Any last questions? Oh, very quick, sorry. Um, sumac, where does that fit in the, I've seen it close to water and away from water, and it's a fabulous looking tree plant. Yeah, it's gorgeous but fall color. Does it do anything for that? It can get a little aggressive, so, you know, it's one of those plants that fire kept in check. Um, so, you know, watch out sometimes, I know, uh, I work with Alacta Flambeau, and it's gotten into some gardens that we have there, for example. However, it's real easy to just pop out and go plant it somewhere else or use it in another part of your property kind of thing. So I like sumac. I think it's pretty easy to work with. I would tell you to wear gloves when you do touch it, though. I think uh, I've had some breakouts kind of thing, or I don't know if uh, it causes issues there, but pay attention to that. <coughs> but I think it has wildlife benefits, makes a great tea, um, other edible uh, dimensions to it, so it can be a great bird plant. It's also that mid-layer we talked about, so, you know, if it's growing on the edge of a woods or, or out in the uh, meadow, it's providing some vertical structure as well for some of our birds, so, um, so I think it has its place in the landscape. Just watch out. It can be a little aggressive sometimes. Yeah, there's a poison sumac that's in wetlands. We'd want to probably stay away from that one, but... Uh, uh, the uh, more the prairie or the one you see as you drive up and down 51 is the, the one I would uh, point you. Yeah, Staghorn. Yes, ma'am. I have a couple questions. One, if you could touch on the salination of the lakes. The, yeah. Uh, due to, I know our own lake where roads have been paved that weren't and now they're plowed and salted and sanded. Um, and then... Uh, a personal question that I have on my own lake shore, which I've been watching for about, oh, 65 years, and notice that it's a shallow shore that's sandy, and when I was small, there was no vegetation, and now with, I'm sure, the runoff and the sediment that's on this south shore, that there's a fine grass, and the grass holds the sediment, and it sort of compounds itself, the more sediment, the more vegetation. And what I was used to as a nice sandy yeah. bottom has become grass. Now, I'm raking up that grass. Am I m 
doing more harm than good. Um, so by law, you as a shoreline property owner can, and can harvest a 30-foot swath in front of your property. That, that species, whatever it is, sounds like cattail. You know, there's some species out there that just love that sediment. When that sediment covers that rock cobble up or covers that sand up and creates that mucky condition, there's some plants like the hybrid cattail that just love it. Reed canary is another one if the water depth isn't too much, and they just, they just go nuts for that kind of uh, situation. I'm not sure what grass you have, if it's uh, a reed canary in young form, perhaps. It's so uh, I'd it say the first step is to get that identified to see what yeah. we're working with, either a native or invasive plant. But m the answer is m there are some plants that that's their sweet spot, man. They love that sediment. Yeah, and you want to you wanna deter it. And to your, se uh, your question about salinity, uh, I don't quite know the answer, but I, I do know that we have a researcher coming to our lakes convention here next week. She's going to give the findings of her recent Wisconsin report. If you don't get to convention, know that every, all the talks at convention are archived and we'll probably also have a Lake Tides article on her findings in the future. So stay tuned, or if you're not signed up for Lake Tides, please sign up on the Extension Lakes website. I'm sure we'll follow that research in, in Lake Tides down the road. But salinity, you know, the salt we've been pouring onto our landscapes to control um, uh, slippery roads is starting to build up on our roadside ditches and in our um, ecosystems. And these folks have been studying that and are going to report out what they're finding. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say as well. That researcher, by the way, is Hillary Dugan from Thank the you. Center for Limnology. Thank you. And you can go to the Center for Limnology. She did a science on tap here about a year, a year and a little bit ago. On that topic? On, the, on salt awesome. on our roads. So, so you, you can have go back another and archive to check out. Look at our uh, archived uh, science on tap. Yeah, it was great. We have, oh, we got a couple of questions. Yeah, Pat, how are you? I'm well. Be kind to me now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the salinity study that was done. I think it was done on Sparkling Lake on Highway 51, and it was done on Trout Lake on County Trunk M. And Trout Lake is a little bit farther off the road than, than uh, Sparkling Lake was. And the, the salt in Sparkling Lake off of Highway 51 was twice as high as it was on Trout Lake up on County Trunk M. Now, um, the townships don't put salt on their roads. They put sand, mm -hmm. OK? Um, but if you are <clears throat> by a river or creek that is on a major state highway, you get salt in the water. And that salt is carried downstream into other lakes and that type of stuff. It would be nice if the, they wouldn't put salt on bridges and just sand on bridges, but that's the way it is. But that study was done up here on two lakes. So it's a good study to read, but it's almost twice as high on Sparkling Lake. Interesting. So, thank you for that. Um, I got, my question is: the Clean Water Act of 1972 kind of took to task all of the big corporations and that type of stuff. And one of the biggest uh, sites of reclamation is on the Fox River, from the Fox River Dam in De Pere down to the Bay of Green Bay, and it's just finishing up after, I think, 25 years of dredging. Now, in that same Clean Water Act, they exempted all farming and ranching nationwide. And we have a good friend in uh, Menominee, Wisconsin, lives on Tainter Lake, Red Cedar River, and goes into Lake Menominee that in August, you can mow the entire length of the Red Cedar. His, his uh, pledge is that his kids, grandkids, cannot swim in Tainter Lake on any day when the ice melts till the ice forms again. His pledge to everybody around him is that he's going to fix that before he dies. Now, all, given that, that situation, almost all of that pollution and that everything coming off farmers' fields all the way to Rice Lake into Tainter Lake is the Red Cedar flowage. And it's almost all farming. And you can't tell a farmer you can't do this anymore. You have to ask them, 
would you mind changing your farming practices so that you don't get run off into creeks and rivers? But now our biggest challenge is agriculture. Am I right? In some watersheds, that's certainly the case. And one of the tools that we've seen get traction to help bring farmers into the loop. Uh, and that's really important that not only farmers are brought in the loop, but if we're going to go and start pointing fingers around the watershed at different folks uh, in terms of nutrients, we better make sure that our shoreland properties are in good shape first. That would be my first suggestion to anyone working with their farmers in their community. The other traction that Tainer, Manoman, and other communities uh, dealing with uh, nutrients coming from the egg community is to do outreach with farmers and to use farmer-led cooperatives or councils that are led by farmers to teach other farmers what the best practices are that they can be thinking about to implement on their farm operations to do help with clean water and habitat. And instead of messengers being folks like me or others, it's a farmer telling another farmer how he's gone or she has gone about doing that. And we've seen great traction with that peer-to-peer -peer kind of relationship with one farmer tell, uh, showing another farmer what's in the toolbox there and helping coach them up on what's possible. The other part of that conversation that's very important is the economics. And part of what that farmer is able to do is show them that there isn't an economic loss by working with clean water and wildlife habitat. In fact, there's gains if we do it in a certain way. And so uh, I would direct people to these farmer-led councils as one tool in the toolbox to help us with those kind of conversations. But they have to be part of the solution. There's no doubt about it. Any more questions? Pat, it's nice to see you again. We met you down in Madison at the cabin, North Cabin Expo. Yeah, yeah. We had a great conversation. And we kind of want to be leaders on our lake in, 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 in working on this. We moved up here, been on the lake for 20, 20 years and, uh, and moved up here recently. And you mentioned a couple things. So you mentioned that you'd be willing to come out and I do lake association meetings and those kinds of things that uh, we can help to start educating other people on our lake. So I just want to mention that as a great suggestion. We plan on taking advantage of that If I could, summer. before your next question, too, one of the things we're working on with Healthy Lakes is creating, it's called an ambassador program, where we use local champions who are up to speed on the Healthy Lakes program to help us be that local um, conduit to help a group like yours get legs. So just know that that ambassador program is we're doing a focus group at this year's convention and using that focus group to inform that ambassador program and get that rolling as part of Healthy Lakes. So just Super. know that that's we'll, coming. We'll I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, I, no, I thought it was that, germane. That, that, that's wonderful. And, and then is there, other than applying for grants for, to, to improve our own properties, um, is there a function, you know, Karen and I, we have 275 feet of frontage. We have, I don't know, 25 feet of usable space and the rest we keep pretty natural. Uh, the problem we have sometimes is the fishermen anchor right in front of us all the time. You know, we'd like to spread that out around the lake. But we also have quite a bit of state land on our lake. Is there programs to approach the state to do what you're talking about, the fish sticks and the dropping the deadheads and the things like that? Into so the often an island that the state owns or a boat landing that the state owns can be maybe the first place to look at for a fish sticks or one of these native plantings. The reason being is sometimes it takes a little while to get the landowners around your lake up to speed and feeling comfortable with the idea. Whereas if we can approach the land manager of that island or the boat landing, usually that can fall in line pretty quick. And if it makes sense for the property, we're often running with a demo project that can be used then to, as a springboard, to educate the local lake group and help move folks down that healthy lakes uh, road. So often those lands can be the place to start perhaps with healthy lakes projects or other shoreland type work. And so food for thought, but uh, I certainly seen that in many communities. Those can sometimes be the first places that make sense to go after.